Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, as as was mentioned this morning, Pastor's traveling. Uh, I'm assuming he's probably not there yet because knowing him, like like he's like us, he probably didn't get gone on time. So I'm sure he's driving at this point. So pray for them as they travel. Um, but thank y'all for coming out tonight, even though Daryl's preaching. <laughs> I pray for him. He's actually not feeling great this evening, so just uh, just pray for him that his stomach will settle, and he'll. Uh, I know he's got a message for us tonight. So let's let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll have the choir sing. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, and thank you for the privilege we have to be back in your house. And Lord, I thank you for this church. Lord, the friendships and the family that we have here, Lord, is just is special. And I thank you, Lord, that we can we can laugh and we can pick with each other, and, and Lord, that we can just. Uh, Enjoy each other's company, and Lord, I, I just, uh, each each person that's here tonight has been a blessing to me, and I pray you'll just bless them. I pray you'll give us a good time of fellowship tonight around your word. Be at the choir as we sing, be with Brother Darrell as he brings the message. Lord, may you just open our hearts and open our ears that we may hear what you have to say to us tonight. In your name we ask it, amen. Oh, 
the 16th will be our work day here at the church from 9 until we get the list done and I think there's a list back in the vestibule if you want to go ahead and take a look at some of that and feel free to sign up for some things and I know in the past people have done some things early so whatever you can do there will be great and then on the 17th will also be choir practice at 430 as well uh, Easter I mean, yeah Easter's right around the corner it's here uh, what four weeks from today I think I said choir is that right Four weeks from today is Easter, so this year is already flying by. Um, and Easter is a little bit early this year, so any other announcements? Um, I'm not, I just wanted to let everybody uh, be aware of it. We're doing Bible school again this year, and uh, Pastor's put me in charge of it. So uh, in the next few weeks, I'm going to announce a meeting for anybody that wants to be involved in it, and we'll, I just want to get a count, see who will be available. Uh, but I'll be letting people know about that. But it's, um, Pastor's not decided, I don't believe, yet on the exact week. But okay. it's going to be, I think right now, it's going to be uh, Sunday night through Wednesday. So um, just put on everybody's radar who might be willing to help out with that. Okay, if you didn't hear that, uh, uh, we're going to have Bible school this year. Um, Daryl's going to be in charge of organizing it. And we'll be getting a meeting together in the next few weeks to, to try to get some volunteers and start getting some things organized there. We don't have an exact date for that yet, but it'll probably be a Sunday through a Wednesday, you said, uh, for Bible school. So uh, it'll be good to have that. I always enjoy the kids being here, and so uh, pray about helping with that. Uh, we can always, judging from years past, we can always use as many hands as we can get. Because um, usually the, 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 the kids that we have have a lot of energy, so... So definitely that's a that's a announcement as well as a prayer request there as well. Any other announcements? Okay, well, let's go ahead and do some prayer requests. Um, as I mentioned, Pastor and them are traveling, so pray for them that they're, as they travel, they'll have safety there. And I know Sue still wasn't feeling great this morning, so pray that she'll get well. I know they've got a lot of games and all planned this week, so uh, pray there. Uh, continue to remember Sam Holt and Randy Holt. Uh, good to see Mr. Jim and, and Ms. Juliet here. Continue to pray for Mr. Jim. Um, pray for all those that are on our prayer list for salvation, especially. Uh, also, um, I got a text today that my uncle, Frank Fox, from up around the um, Pleasant Hill area, um, they've moved him to a hospice house in Burlington, so pray for him. That's my mom's only living sibling. He's 95, so if you'll pray for him. Among other things, he has COVID, but he's also been falling a lot lately and just going downhill in general. Uh, I also um, got a text. Uh, Brother Phil, you may know uh, Stuart Moser from Faith Christian. Right. Uh, he passed away. Really? He was 66. 
Uh, don't know any of the details, but I pray for that family, Stuart Moser. He was ahead of me by about nine years or so in school. Um, you know, this side over here, any prayer requests? My left, your right. All right, right hand side, any prayer requests? Uh, I'll continue to remember um, Josh and Sarah. Uh, the last report we got this morning was they had got the plumbing issues fixed with their house, but their refrigerator still wasn't working. Uh, for those of you that don't know, they, they've got their back in shoot now. And when they got there to their house, uh, I guess because they'd been shut up and it's a jungle area for a while, they had a lot of issues with the house. The refrigerator wasn't working, the plumbing wasn't working. I think they had a mice infestation, several things they had to walk back in and deal with. Uh, kind of discouraging, but they've gotten some of the things taken care of, so continue to pray that they'll get the rest of it taken care of. Pastor mentioned this morning he thought that was a good job for Tony to go take care of, so we'll see. Knowing Tony, he'd probably hop on a plane and go right over. Uh, but just pray for them that, you know, that they'll go well and that Uriah will continue to do well. Um, I know they had something set up where in the event you know, that he does have some issues that they can have him um, evacuated out to a U.S. hospital if need be. So continue to pray for them. Any other prayer requests? All right. If not, um, Brother Richie, would you mind taking these to the, to the throne, please, sir? Our Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity to be in your house tonight, Lord. And uh, we thank you for that precious blood that was shed on Calvary's cross that washed away all of our sins that we sang about. And, uh, Lord, many prayer requests, you know them perfectly. You knew them before we even mentioned them. And, uh, and we just pray that your perfect will might be done in each and every situation. We do think about Josh and Sarah there in Chute, and we just ask you might be with them in a special way, that, that you might give them fruit for their labor. And, Many might come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, we ask you might be with our pastor, put a hedge protection around him and his family, and especially uh, Susanna that's been sick, and just be with them, give them a good week of uh, uh, just refreshment and uh, being able to come back and uh, have uh, an excitement for the Lord and new energy, and just, uh, just watch over them during this time. And, Good to see Brother Jim in the service tonight, and Miss Julieta, and just uh, to ever be with them, and uh, just uh, what our will is that you might touch Brother Jim, and uh, he might be restored to health, and we just surrender uh, that situation to your hands, Lord, and, uh, and I know Brother Jim is uh, just trusting you, and we thank you for his faith and trust in, in you, Lord. Uh, we ask you might continue to be with the Randy Holt family, with Sam and uh, Bethany's uh, dad, and, and uh, just uh, all that's going on there, and uh, just be with them in a special way. And uh, uh, this Frank Fox uh, family, uh, Mandy's uncle, or, or Frank Fox uh, that's uh, in hospice, uh, just be with them in a special way too. And, we thank the Moser family there at uh, Faith Christian and uh, just to be with his family during this time, draw them closer to you and, and just uh, may they uh, just uh, feel your love and your presence uh, during this time and uh, some member of the family that's lost, maybe even during this time they might come to know uh, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And Lord, once again, just uh, we just surrender all these requests to you. And uh, we ask you might be with Brother Darrell tonight. You might give him recall of what he studied. And uh, that you might just give him that special touch from heaven tonight and give us receptive hearts and minds to receive the message tonight. And Lord, once again, we love you and thank you for your great love for us. And once again, we just surrender the night to you and you get all the glory and honor and praise and all these things we ask in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. If you will take your hymn books once again, please, and turn to page 512. Jesus is all the world to me. Let's stand and sing all four verses, please. Page 512.
something special to me because I'm seeing, uh, you know, a word that keeps getting used over and over again is the word folly, the word folly, and, you know, I think of that, and I can't remember where I first heard that word, but probably was watching the Three Stooges, uh, but the word folly is just something silly, you know, and uh, it just amazes me when we get into the Word of God and we see the simplicity of God's love and the simplicity and the truth of God's Word that we um, are simple creatures created for a purpose, and that's for God's pleasure. We are to be what God wants us to be. We're supposed to serve God as he sees fit. But it's amazing how complicated that we can make things. Um, complicated to the point to where when we try to figure out what needs to happen, God and his um, desire for us usually is the last thing that we come to a reconciliation about, you know. Um, just these simple things. I saw uh, a, a little cartoon this week, and it never occurred to me, and I just had to sit there and laugh about it. In the cartoon, it was a little three-panel cartoon, and it was a serpent talking to Eve. And the serpent said, if you consider the tree of knowledge, 
and he said, we're not supposed to, you know, eat of it, not even supposed to look at it. He said, well, if you ate of that tree, you would be just like God. You would have the power and the light and the wisdom of God. And the last time the cartoon, Eve looked at the serpent and said, why don't you eat it then? <coughs> I thought about that. I said, you know, that never occurred to me, but that's a pretty, good, pretty smart answer. And, um, but as we're look, going to be looking at Ivan Solomon, I want, to, I want to clarify, there's two things that we're going to be talking about tonight, wisdom and labor. Wisdom and labor. Now, when Solomon, he uses a term a lot of times in the book of Ecclesiastes, he uses the term under the sun. That's kind of the little code word or code phrase that when you hear that, he's talking about earthly things. When he talks about labor under the sun, he's not talking about the work that we would do for God. He's talking about your job, your business, the things that you're doing in your life or your livelihood. And that's what he's going to be talking about labor a lot in this passage tonight. And then he also, when he's talking about wisdom, we know that God gave Solomon wisdom. There's been no one that's had the wisdom, the riches, um, the renown uh, like Solomon before him and since then. And this is all a gift of God. But, you know, God did bless him with wisdom, and it wasn't only godly <laughs> wisdom. He had godly wisdom because we see that he came to a realization, as we've looked at before, of... What we do other than for God is empty. He uses the phrase vanity. Not only is it empty, but he says it's a vexation of spirit. Not only is it empty and brings nothing really of fulfillment to our lives, but also the desire for it and the attention that we put on it causes our spirit to even, as we'll see tonight, it even takes our rest away from us. Um, have you ever laid in bed at night and been tired but just there's something going on with your job or something going on with your business and you know your your body's weary but your mind is just racing and just focuses on that you know that's not how God wants us to live God wants us, wants us to rest in him he wants us to rest in the knowledge and the love and the safety of the son the Lord Jesus Christ that's what Jesus wants for us but we complicate things so I hope we'll look tonight, you know, Solomon comes up with one of the things that, you know, if we look at, we have it, uh, and we'll, we'll close with that here in a little bit, but if we have this, these small things that Solomon gives us, he said, man can't ask for better than that. But um, just a small bit of background, I think, you know, we've talked about it enough, but Solomon, again, he had wisdom, and Solomon decided he wanted to go out in his life, and he wanted to look at the things that men put in front of God. Whether it be food, whether it be drink, whether, whether it be entertainment, whether it be women, whether it be power, all these different things, Solomon says that he kept absolutely nothing back from himself. If he saw it and he wanted it, he went and took it. Um, not in a, well, I, let me change that. That sounds like he was robbing somebody, but no, he had the money and the power that he could just have whatever he wanted. You know, if he had it today's time, you know, is there a famous band that you like, bluegrass band, country band, rock band, whatever it is, a, a real famous singer? You know, it was not outside the realm of him calling, saying, hey, I want them to come play at my birthday party. And it would probably happen. And that's the kind of power that this man had. But yet, as he saw all of these things pile up in his life, they brought the same thing, the understanding and the realization that they were all empty. There was nothing he was going to keep to himself. Well, you know, uh, one thing that I've always heard in my life is, you know, leave a good name for yourself. When you're gone, leave something of yourself that people can talk about. I don't know how good it is, but several people that I know never even met my dad, they know about my dad. You know, they know a lot of things about him. I've had people come up and tell me stories. I mean, I've told you guys this before. Nothing horrible or wicked, you know, but I had a guy come up to me one time, and he said, man, I remember one time me and your daddy went to eat at uh, Brownie Lou's, and he told me a story. And I said, you know, I was 42 years old at the time. I said, I could have went the rest of my life without hearing that. But my dad had a name that he left for himself. But, you know, at some point, nobody's going to be talking about him anymore. A lot of you know me. 
You know, I've uh, told the young people, I said, when I die, I don't want anybody to give a eulogy. I just want anybody that's ever been in my class to stand up and say one thing that I taught them in, in life. You know, and I have a feeling that Hannah warns me all the time that she tells her kids stories about me. I don't know how good that's going to go and how good that's not, but, you know, the thing is, at some point, my name will no longer be mentioned. But the things that are going to matter are the things that I did for Christ. And I hope they far outweigh anything that I ever do to bring attention to myself. Um, but we're going to start tonight. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. <clears throat> and um, so we're talking about, again, remember, we're talking about wisdom. We're talking about labor. These are things that Solomon's going to mention. But we're talking about the earthly kind here. And we're going to start in verse 10. He says, And whatsoever mine eyes desire, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. So he's saying he looked, and he's like, you know what? In my business dealings, in the things that I've done, I looked at them, and I'm like, I did them well. I did a good job. You know, any of you that have ever uh, had a business, you know, that's something that you want. You want people and other people in the business to look at you and say, that guy knows what he's doing. Or that lady knows what she's doing. They are doing it right. You can learn something from them. And Solomon saw, he said, I can look and I can see in the way I conducted my business. And I can see the, the way that people look at me and regard me. And I can rest in my portion in that. You know, that, that's, that's where I'm getting my pleasure. But then we look in verse 11 and he says, <clears throat> um, then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity, or emptiness, and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. And this is what Solomon was realizing. He said, all this work that I've done, the riches that I may be laying up, you know, the treasure here, the name even that I'm building up for myself, there's no good in it. There's no profit in it. And why? He's going to get to that, you know. In verse 12, he says, And I turn myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king, <clears throat> even that which has been already done? Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as the light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself received also <clears throat> that one event happeneth to them all. So he says here, he said, you know, I'm going to look at everything that goes on. I'm going to look at wisdom, and I'm going to look at folly. And he says there, I'm going to look at madness. You know, we can look around today and see what we would say is madness. You know, and, you know, if we really, if you really think about the things that we look at today, and we say, man, that's just insanity. That's crazy. You know what we're seeing? We're seeing man's ego and man's pride, and man's addic addiction to pleasing self run amok. That's what we're seeing. You know, because everyone wants to have their own belief. Everyone wants to have, you know, the, the, the phrase that's popular right now is, live your truth. If you believe it, and if it's right to you, then that's what truth is. Yeah, you want to you wanna see people that you know that have different versions of truth? If you have more than one kid, get them all together and ask them what their childhood was like. Everybody lived in the same house, but everybody's got a different idea of who the favorite was and what they the uh, who the one that got the most favoritism or who the favorite was and things like that. You know, everyone has what they feel is their own personal belief. And that's one of the things that people want to reject about God. You know, a lot of times what we see in the world isn't necessarily rejection of God. It's a rejection of the idea of God because we don't want to submit to anyone other than ourselves. We don't want anyone to tell us that anything is right that disagrees with what we think is right. But you can't crack open the Bible and read a chapter into it. If you know nothing about God without being confronted with the truth, the truth, that's going to contradict your truth. 
And here we see that Solomon is looking and he's trying to live his life and he's looking around and he says, well, you know, these are the things that are right. Every man wants to leave a good name. Every man wants to do his business well. Every man wants to leave something for his family. You know, it's the term they use today, generational wealth. You know, they, they want you to leave something for somebody else. Let me tell you something. Solomon comes up here, and uh, we'll, we'll have a participation uh, right here. He says, <clears throat> in verse 14, The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself, I myself perceive also that one event happeneth to them all. What's one event that's going to happen to the fool? It's going to happen to the crazy person? It's going to happen to the wise man? Well, that? Well, we're going to die. I'll just move it, sorry. Death. Well, we're going to die. Death, there you go. Thank you, sorry. My my ears are catching up with my eyes. I can't hear any better than I can see. <laughs> Dalton's already cursed me with that tonight. Um, Maggie, I need to talk to you a little bit later on. Anyway. So, um, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Every single now, we know in the New Testament, if, if the Lord um, <clears throat> tarries, we're all going to face death at some point. And that's here what Solomon realized. He said, you know, almost what's the point of living an earthly, wise life? Because I'm going to die the exact same as the fool is. There's not going to be anything better about my death than it's going to be about somebody else. So a lot of times, you know, we think, well, no, but we want to leave something. We want to leave something for our children. We want to leave something to be known. I, did any of you guys see where the um, uh, the lady left the donation to the, uh, the Einstein Medical School here this last uh, week? Uh, her husband was a friend of Warren Buffett's, and he started investing whenever Warren Buffett was just getting started, really took his advice. And so the um, Einstein uh, School of Medicine she donated a billion dollars. And so starting this year in the spring, that school is tuition free forever. No student that ever has to go to school there will ever have to pay tuition again. Now, do you think their applications are going to go up here in the next little bit? I've never even heard of the Einstein School of Medicine. But you can imagine their, you know, their applications are going to go up. But here's the thing about that. You know, I'm, I'm sure that man or that lady's name will be on something somewhere in that school. But guess it's going to burn up. It's going to burn up. Whatever you put somebody's name, put your name on, it's not going to be here. What's going to matter? It's going to matter what's written in heaven. The treasure that you work for that's here. As the Bible says, it's going to rust, it's going to canker, the moth is going to eat it up. But what we lay up in heaven is what's going to be eternal. <clears throat> the name that we have here. You know, I was thinking about this. You know, um, Jesus had a job when he was alive. What was his job? His earthly job? Carpenter. Carpenter. Can you imagine if somebody actually was able to realistically find a piece of furniture or something that Jesus, the Lord Jesus, built with his own hands, why would you think anything like that exists today? Well, first of all, we probably worship it like, like an idol. Remember the Shroud of Turin? You know, people would come in and they didn't care anything at all about the Lord Jesus, but they wanted to go and see something that he was possibly buried in. Paul who many consider the greatest Christian that ever lived, he had a job. What was that? Tent maker. You know, why, why don't we have tents made by Paul's hands hung up in museums nowadays? Because they all have a job, an earthly job, to work the way God intended them for them to do. But yet what we remember and what we're talking about now, some 2,000 plus years later, are the things that God did. That's what we should be striving for. And we'll look here and see exactly what Solomon, you know, he continued to look at <clears throat> as far as his understanding of these things. Verse 15, he said, Then said I in my heart, as it happened to the fool, so it happened even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also was vanity. 
For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And now dieth the wise man, and how dieth the wise man as the fool. And so he's understanding here just what we talked about. The, the things that we leave here on this earth, as far as it, I just feel like that, the things we leave here on this earth, the things that you've done in your physical body, for your physical body, they're going to be gone. Um, how many of you know the name Jim Fix? Most of you don't. He was there in the 70s. He's the man that really popularized jogging as a form of exercise. You know, it, it became something that everybody started doing. This is back before they started doing aerobics and things like that. But this man was the picture and pinnacle of health. He had an entire industry that started up about him and his health. Do you know how that man died? Jogging. He had a heart attack, and he fell over dead. So, all the preparation, all the name uh, that he built up for himself was gone in an instant. And almost, you would seem kind of foolish, you know, this kind of an idea. But no matter what your body is, the, the, the healthy fool and the diseased wise man are going to go the same way. And that's here what he's saying. So what, what is the point of even being wise? And I've said this before, if we, if, we're, if we don't look at the words of Solomon with a godly view and with the Holy Spirit, the blessed Holy Spirit teaching us as God has given it, we can have a very... Uh, I, I guess the, the, the term nihilistic, you know, hey, we're born, we're all going to die, so nothing matters. That sounds like the kind of the idea that Solomon has here. And if you don't have any sort of an idea of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't have an idea of eternity, if you, as Pastor Bobby said this morning, if eternity is not the vision with which you look everything through the idea of eternity, then yes, nothing matters. Nothing matters. And I don't say that tonight, and Solomon, was his words weren't recorded and preserved tonight for us to go home and sit there going, man, nothing matters. Why am I going to go to work tomorrow? I'm just going to go to work, get a paycheck, and at some point die. You know, uh, everybody that I know is eventually going to die. I'm going to die. Everybody that I've ever known is going to die. So I'm just going to go home and not care. That's not the purpose of these things. And we can't stop in our sanctified imagination looking at our lives and thinking in this kind of a way. Because if you're breathing, you have the opportunity to serve God. If you can think, excuse me, you have the ability to serve God. A man paralyzed, a quadriplegic, that can't speak, that can't hear, that can't see, that can't move, can lie in the bed and in his mind pray for others to a holy God. Now that would sound like a uh, tragedy of an existence, we would probably say today. I would almost guarantee you that man is going to stand higher than we are in the kingdom of heaven. Maybe that's just me. But it's the things that we're doing, not for ourselves, but for God. And when we talk about the labor, I shared something with Pastor Bobby that I'd seen the other day. Um, you know, we always ask God for the ability to do something. God, give me the ability to do this. Give me the ability to do that. You know, instead, and this is just a, a, a little passing thought here, instead we ought to thank God for our inability because the fact we can't do it and that we recognize we can't do it opens us wide open to letting God do it through us as he intended. We use the same analogy several times. Our lives are to be like an empty, dry creek bed. And we go through and we have our ego, we have our self, we have our pet sins. We have our preconceptions. All these different things, our, what we, our dreams, our hopes. And these are all things that can 
act like garbage and debris and trash in that creek bed. And Christ wants to be the life giving water that flows through that creek bed. All he wants us to do is to allow him to work and to flow through us. You ever seen a creek that was all full of trash and limbs and leaves and garbage and things like that? You know, you might have a, a rush of water ready to come, but it, nothing can get through but a trickle. And Solomon is sitting here, and Solomon is looking at his life, and he's saying, my riverbed is completely stopped up. It's stopped up. And he, God gives him this wisdom. Now, do you think God, when he gave Solomon, you know, he told Solomon he'd give him what he wanted. Solomon said, I want wisdom. Do you think God was sitting there looking at Solomon, you know, here in his later years and going, well, no, I didn't. I didn't want you to get wisdom to, to, to look at how bad everything was. I wanted you to, to understand the, the glory in life and how happy everything could be a life lived for me. God knew exactly what Solomon was going to come to realize. And not only did God know it, but God saw fit to preserve it in his holy word so that we could understand. We'll never be able to do what Solomon was able to do. We'll never have the freedom that Solomon had. I'm talking about under the sun, worldly things. We're never going to have the money Solomon had. We're never going to be able to do the things Solomon did. We're never going to have the reach and the power as king that Solomon had. We're never going to have it. But the man that could, there was nothing under the sun that could be held back from him, and he realized that was all empty if that's what you're living for. And that's why God shared it with us. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen. How many of you deny to worry about what's going to happen to your billions tomorrow if the stock market crashes? I would say not nobody. If it is, I'll stop preaching now and we'll talk. <laughs> do we not care? Do we not take care of the things that God's called us to do? The Bible says if a man doesn't work, he's worse than an infidel. A man needs to take care of his family. We need to work. We need to have to provide for our families. But that's not still not the most important thing. As we continue looking, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we're starting to see why he thought, you know, in verse 17, he says, therefore, I hated life. That's just a statement right there. I hated life. <clears throat> Man, can you imagine just looking and, and having the things that Solomon had and then saying they're all empty to be able to stay, say as a statement, I hate life. Why? Because everything's empty. Because the, because the work that is brought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor, which I have taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. So not only are we seeing his nihilistic view of nothing matters, he's almost jealous of the fact that I'm going to work my entire life and then somebody else is going to reap the benefit from it. The day that you die, whatever you have in your investments, they're going to pass on to somebody else. And let's say at the moment of your death, you're worth $1.5 million at the point of your death. And you look the day before you die and say, I've built up something good. I've worked, and you think back of the 50 years that you work. You think back to your first job as a paper uh, deliverer or washing dishes or as a waiter or a waitress, and you think back on the years that you went to college and you took got a business degree, and then the times that you worked late and you got up early in order to build something for your family to have, and the day before you die, you look at your bank account and you say, man, I'm worth $1.5 million. I have done something. And then you die that night, and the next day, that knuckleheaded young and you had that ain't worth a day in his life, guess what? He's worth that $1.5 right then. 
And Solomon looked at that, and Solomon was like, that ain't right. I'm mad about the work that I've done because it's going to go to somebody that maybe has not done the things that I've done. Solomon seeing the emptiness in yourself being valued on the things that you've done. In 2024, we need to understand it's not the things that you've done. It's the things that Christ has done through you. Our name can be written on buildings from now till the earth burns up. And again, those buildings are going to burn up. But what's written in heaven will last for eternity. There should be our focus. <clears throat> if we continue reading, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, verse 22. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, no. I went down too far. I apologize. Um, in verse 20, he says, Therefore, I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labor therein shall he leave it for his portion. This also is vanity and a great evil. So he said here, he even looked at it, he said, it's just not right. It's, all, it's, it's an evil for a man to work his entire life and then for it to pass to a man that doesn't deserve it. To the point to where he hated the work that he had done. He wasn't proud of his labor. He wasn't proud of the business he had built. He wasn't proud of his family. He was like, I have wasted everything. And it was empty because I, it's going to go to someone that was undeserving. Now, you know, uh, Sol Solomon, I don't necessarily want to call him a prophet, but who knows what happened after Solomon. You know, Solomon was the, the king over Israel. Anybody know what happened after Solomon died? Kingdom split. Kingdom split. You know, so I don't know what foreknowledge Solomon had of what was going to happen after him, but Solomon was one of the, uh, I don't want to say the good kings, but Solomon was one of the kings here that saw the focus on God and God alone as being important. And you got to remember his heritage. You know, he came up from David. You know, there's things that David did for God that I'm sure aren't recorded here in the Bible that Solomon had a first-hand knowledge of. And not only did Solomon see the things that his father had done and have intimate knowledge of them, I'm quite sure Solomon heard a lot more about David's shortcomings than we did. You know, he had a brother that had died because of his father's sin. It's something that may have weighed on him. And he understood here, you know, all the things that were passed to him. Now, that, that's the other thing that's interesting, um, is when you look at Solomon and what was given to Solomon, you know, uh, the kingdom was given to Solomon. Uh through the actions of the other members of David's family. You know, there were others that were in line before Solomon. But through the actions of David and the, I hate to call it a curse, but, but what kind of trickled down throughout the family because of David's sin, this fell to Solomon. There may be a time when Solomon looked at his life and said, I'm not worthy of what I've been given. David wanted to build a temple. God said, don't want you to do it. Told David to prepare. Who knows what the temple was called when it was finally built? Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple. Who did the work? David planned it. David gathered everything. And it was given to Solomon. And to this day, it's called, you know, when we talk about it here, it's called Solomon's temple. You know, Solomon is understanding in his wisdom and even in his despair, he's understanding his true place. And if we look at the things that we've built in our lives, whether it be a good reputation through our business, whether it be a good reputation of charity, of kindness, none of those things would be, you would not be capable of any of them if it wasn't for the grace and the mercy of God that gives you the ability to do those things. The ability to go and take a meal to somebody. 
the ability to give somebody a phone call just to encourage them, the ability to come up alongside somebody and put your arm around them and weep with them, you know, the things that are actually going to matter. They would not be in your realm of possibility if it weren't for the grace and mercy of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so he continues and he says, <clears throat> Excuse me. For what man hath of all his labor and his vexation of heart wherein he has labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrow and his, and his travail grief, yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is vanity. Again, the idea of you are so focused on the earthly things that even when you're tired and you have the opportunity to take rest, you can't. You know, I've heard the phrase before, you know, I was, I was tired but my mind was racing. My mind was racing. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's love. He's compassion. The only true truth, love, and compassion that exists. But he's also rest. He's also rest. He is the rock. He is the rock that everything that I am should be built on. And there is nothing like having a foundation that you don't have to worry about. Now, you know, I can stand and say that my foundation is the Lord Jesus, but then look at what I built. Guess what? That can all come crumbling down. Foundation is going to still be there. So what do I need to do? I need to say, okay, God, you provided the foundation. Now, just like Solomon, provide the plans, provide the materials. Let me build something that is just as strong as what the foundation is. I am not going to do it. Daryl Gaines is not going to build anything that can stand on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I can get Daryl Gaines out of the way and let the Lord Jesus build on something. And that's never going to fail. It'll be written in heaven. <clears throat> so what does he say? Verse 24. You know, what, what is good? What, if all these things are evil, the vexation of spirit, what is good? And I love this because he tells us there's something that we all can have. He says there is nothing better for a man than he should eat and dream. And that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. Now, this right here goes, it, it, to me, this verse encompasses so much that we hear in other places of the Bible where God wants us to take each day as it is. Take each day as it is. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised next week. Now, the Bible is clear on something. If there's something that God puts on our heart, to do uh, a, a task God wants us to prepare. You know, the Bible says, you know, that if a man plans on building a barn and then he doesn't plan for it, he gets halfway through, then people are going to mock him because, uh, you know, he started building that thing, didn't have enough money to finish it. So now <clears throat> that half-finished barn is going to be uh, almost a, a testimony against him for not doing the right thing. But yet the Bible also tells us don't say, hey, next week we're going to go into this town and we're going to do this and we're going to do this. The Bible says to simply say, if God will. If God will allow us to do those things, these are what my plans are. Because the, the key to that, it's not something you just say. It's not something that we just say, you know, I remember uh, me and Brother Richie, a lot of times when we would uh, leave in the evenings, I would always, you know, one of us would say to the other one, and say, I'll see you Sunday or I'll see you Wednesday or something, say, yeah, Lord willing. And I told Brother Richie, I said, stop saying that to me. I said, because you say Lord willing, if I don't come on Wednesday night, that might just be my sorriness. Don't put the Lord's will on me being a sorry Christian and not coming to church on Wednesday night. Um, yeah, I want to be here on Wednesday night, but I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I, I may be, as the Pastor Ken, you say, provincially hindered where I can't be here, but you know what? I'm still flesh and blood, and I could just get up and say, you know what, I just don't feel like going. 
I could still be that sorry. I could. And I need to remember that. Because if I don't remember that, then I can come up with a reason and blame, well, well, this must not be the Lord's will. I don't feel good today. It must not be the Lord's will that I should go to church. Never ask God. God, what do you want me to do? God, I don't feel good. Do you want to give me the strength to go, or do you want me to stay away tonight for the sake of everybody else? Or you know, I, I don't know what God wants me to do. But the idea is we take our relationship with God day by day. Every single one of us tonight, I'm sure, has something to eat. Everybody has something to drink. The things that you did today, God wants us to be able to lay our head down and say, you know what? Praise God. Through his grace and his mercy, I had a good day. It's not about what we've done for the last 20 years. All that can be burned up. I've heard of people that have lost entire fortunes overnight. Something completely out of their control. Start mar stock market could crash. You could lose everything. But if your focus is, God, what do you want me to have for today? What do you want me to do with today? With no thought for tomorrow because God's going to take care of tomorrow. He says there's nothing better for a man than that. There's nothing better. As Paul said, what the two days Paul was concerned with, what days were those? This day and that day. This, and we need to have that same attitude. God, what is, is it about today? Let me be the best conduit for the Lord Jesus Christ I can possibly be today. And Lord, I know you're going to handle what's tomorrow. Well, guess what? You know, sometimes it might happen we lay our heads down at night and we're like, God, I failed you today. I failed you severely. And we recognize it and we say we're sorry. Guess what? Tomorrow's a brand new day. Tomorrow is a brand new day. Because if you sin today, guess what? And when I say sin, I'm, not, I'm talking about maybe not doing what God wanted you to do, a sin of omission instead of a sin of commission that we've committed. But if we just didn't live up to what God wants us to do today, the Bible says that God chooses not to remember it. It's as far from the east is from the west. We wake up the next morning, a fresh day, God, I'm going to serve you today. Um, and we continue reading, and this is what he says here in verse 30 or 25. For who can eat or who else can hasten here unto more than I? He's saying who, who can do more eating and who can go places and who can do the things I'm talking about more than I can? And in verse 26, he says, For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up, that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. He says that God gives a man the good things. He gives him wisdom and, he knowledge, and knowledge and joy. <clears throat> you may look and you may see the sinner that is built up all kinds of riches. You may see a man that you know is wicked and he has more than he could ever imagine. I remember hearing a singer one time and he was doing an interview on 60 Minutes and they asked him, they said, how much money do you actually have? And his answer, he said, I have more money than my grandchildren's grandchildren could ever spend. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. I don't know the man's spiritual condition, but I've, I've read articles about him and heard some things. I don't know for a fact that he's saved. But here's the thing that we need to remember, what Solomon is saying here. That man may have those things, but you know what God's doing? God may allow that man to collect the riches so that God can give them to his people when God sees fit. And not given to build us up, but given to us to be used of God. There's not a red cent that's ever been pressed. There's not a green dollar that's ever been printed that doesn't belong to God. The gold that our currency is based on 
It's something that God created in this earth long before we were ever even thought about to ourselves. God knew who we were. But, it, you know, we, we always say he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the hills too. Well, yeah, let's add to it. He owns all the gold that might be under those hills as well. So we understand that somebody else might be, quote unquote, in charge of it right now. But just know that it belongs to the one that you serve. And when he sees fit, he's going to use it for his purpose. Now, what is our role in all this? It's because we've gone through all this. How do we go through life and understand and we look around and we see that it's not all vanity? It's not all empty. And even when we look and we see the good things, uh, there, there was a song that came out several years ago called More Money, More Problems. And a lot of times, you know, you think about that. That's a uh, kind of an attitude that people, you know, they don't want to admit to that. But, you know, I, tonight, I, I, I'm not worried about checking the stocks before I go to bed. I'm not going to grab my phone and go through them first thing in the morning. I'm going to tell you what, if I had several hundred thousand dollars tied up in it, that would be something that I would be extremely concerned about tonight and tomorrow. If I was living the way that most people are living today. But what God wants to what does God want us to do? In service of God, you may have a huge victory. And when I say that, you may be obedient to God. You may God may see fit to allow you to lead somebody to Christ. But you know what? If your day is simply the meal that God provided, the refreshment that God gave you, and the love of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we look back at our day and we say that is, and I'm saying this, quote unquote, all that we have, Solomon says a man can't ask for better than that. So what was the, the purpose of tonight? I, I, the, the title of the message tonight was, was what is prosperity? What is prosperity? Um, Solomon, the most prosperous man that ever lived and realized that it was empty. He realized that it was vanity, and he realized that the more he had, the more it damaged his soul. But yet, he said, a man can ask for nothing better than food and rest in his Savior. And I pray that we would have these eyes when we look at our lives. You know, I don't know what happened to you today. I don't know what's going to happen to you the rest of the night. But we can all wake up tomorrow morning in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ the love he has for us, and the rest that we can only have from him. We won't have any formal invitation tonight. Um, we'll just uh, have a word of prayer and be dismissed. Again, I thank you for being here. Father, I do thank you for your word, the preservation of it. I pray I was faithful to bring the message that you would have me to, uh, to speak tonight. Lord, I, do, don't, I don't take the opportunity lightly that you've given me to be able to preach tonight, but I pray that it was you that spoke and not me. Lord, I pray that... No one would remember me, but remember instead any truth that you have uh, shared tonight. Lord, I thank you again for the uh, for the people that are here tonight. I thank you for allowing them to be out tonight. Lord, I just thank you for uh, the conviction that we uh, need in our hearts and our lives to look at our lives, uh, not through um, a daily need, I guess, but instead looking at it through a worldly view. Help us, Father, instead to have... The, uh, the view of eternity and what's going to matter when all this is gone. You will still be established, you and your word, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you again for who you are, for all that you've done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.